how are all of you? I hope everyone is fine and staying safe. Um, so I will be taking the lecture today in, in place of Dr. Hina. Okay, so today we're basically going to be doing um, an important topic, right? So introduction to uh, pathology in the CNS. So basically the reactions of the uh, uh, neural tissue to injury. That's one aspect of it. Okay, and then we'll also be covering uh, cerebral edema. And then one of the, the major part of the lecture will be on uh, cerebral hypoxia, which is very important. As you know, we have lots of morbidity and mortality related to cerebral hypoxia. Okay, so without further ado, uh, let's carry on. Okay, um, before I go on, um, just to remind you of proper uh, classroom etiquette or netiquette since we are online. Okay, please no cross chat. Okay, however, I like a more interactive style, you know that. So um, feel free to stop and use the chat. Um, the chat will be enabled. So please use the chat to ask any questions that you want during the lecture, okay? But please relate it to the lecture. I've had students while I'm giving a lecture asking me, okay, ma'am, concept textbooks use on ma'am, that is not what I mean, okay? When I'm saying to ask questions, then you can ask questions related to the lecture, okay? All right, so let's go on. So as I said, please feel free anytime you need anything repeated, you didn't understand, use the chat and uh, I will be keeping an eye on the chat and I will try and answer your questions as we go along, okay? So as I told you, uh, we're going to be looking at the reactions of neurons and glial cells to injury, then we're gonna be talking about cerebral edema. And then the major part of the lecture will be on cerebral hypoxia, okay. Okay, so just before we go into the pathology, first we have to obviously know the, the normal anatomy uh, before we are able to recognize abnormal morphology, okay? So let's just quickly look at the cells of the nervous system. Okay, so as you know, the main, the bulk of the CNS is made up of the neurons, okay? And this a neuron is a functional unit of the CNS, okay? Then you have a whole lot of other cells, right? So there's astrocytes, there's oligodendrocytes, there's microglia, and there are ependymal cells, okay? And all these together make up the glia, right? So the astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, microglia, ependymal cells, they make up what we call the glia. Okay, so when we're talking about glial cells or when we are talking about glial reactions, then we are talking about these, this group of cells. And the microglia, you know, are the basically the macrophages of the CNS. You will remember that all throughout our body, we always have macrophages everywhere throughout our body. And these are our, like guarding our borders, if you can think of it that way. They are there to phagocytose enemy, enemy intruder. Okay, so these are the cells of the nervous system. Okay, and this is the neuron, right, that we were talking about. This is the basic functional unit uh, of the CNS, right? So this is a cut section showing you this. This is the cell body, right, the nucleus, all the intracellular organelles, and then this is the uh, axon, right? And these are all the uh, processes. Okay, the dendrites, right? Um, and in the CNS, you know, there's something called nissel substance. Uh, this is uh, found in the uh, cytoplasm, right? And uh, it, it plays a major role in protein synthesis, okay? Named after a, a scientist named Franz Nissel, who first discovered these granules, okay? Okay, just briefly, uh, these are astrocytes, okay? And look at all the myriads of processes that are coming out from this, right? Astro, mean like a star, okay? So that's why it's called an astrocyte because of all these processes like a star burst, okay? So astrocytes, um, this is the microglial cell here. Uh, this is the oligodendrocyte. And if you remember the oligodendrocytes, what is their function? They wrap their cytoplasmic processes, go around axons, uh, 
responsible for myelination of the axons, okay? And these are ependymal cells, okay? These resemble columnar ciliated cells and what they do is they are in the lining of the ventricles and in the choroid. Okay, so these are the four uh, types of glial cells that we spoke about. Right, um, these are neurons, okay? And you can see these granules in here. This is the nissel substance, okay? And all these are the glial cells in between that you are seeing. And you can see there's a lot more glial cells than there are neurons, okay? Okay, and this is just normal brain tissue, okay? Showing you a blood vessel here. It's lined by um, endothelial cells. Okay. Uh, just another picture of astrocytes. Okay, this one is using a special stain um, to highlight the astrocytes. And this is a particular stain for a protein called glial fibrillary acidic protein, GFAP. Okay, so this is an immunohistochemical stain. And this also shows highlights, you know, the processes. These are oligodendrocytes. Okay, notice the halo around it. That's because of the myelination. Myelin is fatty, so that's why it's washed away in our typical HNE stains, right? And that's why you have this clear space around it. Okay, and these are ependymal cells and they look exactly like ciliated columnar cells. Uh, okay, and these are microglia, right? So cluster of microglia, which are the soldiers, the macrophages of the CNS, okay? So the easy way to remember that microglia are macrophages, okay? All right, so everyone happy so far? Anyone need anything repeated? Yes, no, still sleeping? Can I carry on? Okay, since you guys are not answering, I'll just carry on. Okay, all right. So some of you are saying, let's move ahead. Okay, TK. Right, so now we go on to the actual pathology, right? So here now we're gonna look at the reactions of all these uh, various cells to injury, okay. So the reaction, so starting off with the first one, we're gonna look at reactions of neurons to injury, okay? So this reaction now, it may be an acute process, okay? Or it may be a slower, you know, more chronic sort of ongoing process, okay? And acute process is usually due to a decrease in oxygen or glucose supply to the brain, okay? Or it may be, may be trauma, right? So these are the commonest causes of acute uh, injury to the neuron, right? So decreased oxygen is a hypoxia, okay? Hypoglycemia or trauma, okay? Then the slower, the more chronic processes are usually due to accumulation of some kind of uh, abnormal protein, okay? So acute neuronal injury, the other term for this is a red neuron and we'll see why it's called red neuron just now, right? So that's acute neuronal injury. And then the, the slower process is the subacute and the chronic neuronal injury, right? And then you also get something called axonal reaction, right? So red neuron, what is a red neuron, right? So this basically refers to a spectrum of changes that accompany acute nervous system hypoxia, okay, or ischemia, or any other acute insult. So this is just a spectrum of changes that we see in acute injury, right? And this is the earliest marker of neuronal cell death, okay? So if you start to see red neurons, that's bad news, okay? And these are usually visible by about 12 to 24 hours after the insult has taken place, okay? And what happens is that there's shrinkage of the cell body, there's uh, the nucleus becomes pyknotic, pyknotic the nucleolus disappears or just dissolves away. There's loss of this nissel substance that we mentioned, and there's intense eosinophilia, right? And hence we get the term 
red neurons. They look red on when we look at it on our uh, HNE, hematoxylin and eosin staining, okay, which is the standard stain that we use in histopathology. Okay, so these are called red neurons. Okay, and if you look at this picture, you can see all these bright pink cells. See these ones where I'm pointing? These are all red neurons. Okay, you can see they're scattered throughout. Right, and this is a higher magnification. Okay, you can see the they're brighter pink than their surrounding tissue. Okay, so that was acute neuronal injury or red neurons, right? Then we come to the subacute and chronic neuronal injury. And the other term for this is also degeneration because it's such a slow and chronic ongoing process. This is called degeneration, right? So what is degeneration? This basically is neuronal death. And this is because of progressive diseases, right? That carry on for some duration, right? Such as, for example, Alzheimer's disease, okay? This is the commonest one. And the characteristic feature here is cell loss, right? Remember there's neuronal death, so there's cell loss. And the thing is often it selectively involves functionally related groups of neurons. Functionally related means the group of neurons that is responsible for doing one particular task, right? So functionally, not necessarily structurally. You understand the difference, right? Structurally means physically they may be present in one place, okay? But functionally means they may be present in different places, but together they form one task, okay? Right, so you'll find cell loss and you'll find reactive gliosis. We'll talk more about reactive gliosis because that's part of the astrocytic uh, reactions. Okay, and the thing is it's difficult to detect early on, but often the clue is when you see reactive gliosis, then you know there's been some sort of injury to the brain. Okay, and the cell uh, loss is thought to occur by apoptosis. Okay, so we'll just briefly mention some neuronal inclusions that you might see, right? And inclusions are common, uh, they may occur in aging, okay? There may be accumulation of, uh, you know, complex lipids like lipofuscin, okay? That's a complex lipid. And you know, you all know that lipofuscin is a wear and tear pigment. So it's commonly found in uh, elderly people, okay? You can find it in the heart muscle as well, right? It's a golden brown sort of pigment, okay? Or you can get accumulation of proteins, carbohydrates, whatever, okay? So all these may cause um, inclusions, right? You can also get abnormal accumulations in these metabolic disorders, you know, the genetically inherited metabolic disorders, uh, like storage disorders, you know, there's Tay-Sachs disease, there's Niemann-Pick disease. There's a whole list of them, right? But that's outside the scope of this lecture. Okay. Um, then cer uh, certain viral infections can cause uh, neural inclusions, right? Can anyone think of any viral uh, disease where you can get inclusions? Anyone? Yes, good. Anusha, herpes, yes. So you can get in herpes virus, rabies, good. Muchtaba, good. Yes, rabies. Yeah, any other virus you can think of? Right, so the one in herpes is called, yes, good. Muchtaba, CMV virus, good. All right, so cowdery body is the intranuclear inclusions in herpes, and they are intranuclear, right? Then you can get cytoplasmic inclusions in rabies, okay? Those are called the, um, hang on, let me just move this chat box down. Okay, in rabies, so that's called a negri body. And you can get both nuclear and cytoplasmic inclusions in CMV infections, right? Cytomegalovirus, okay. Then certain degenerative diseases can also exhibit intracytoplasmic inclusions like Alzheimer, you find something called neurofibrillary tangles. And literally it's just a bunch of fibers, right? 
That's why it's called tangles, neurofibrillary tangles. So that's an Alzheimer's disease. Then in Parkinson's disease, you get something called Lewy bodies, right? So there's a whole spectrum of inclusions that can be found inside the neuron. Some are in the nucleus, some are in the cytoplasm. And some may have both nucleus, uh, nuclear and cytoplasmic. Okay, how are we doing for time? Okay, let's move on quickly because we still have to do a lot more. Mm, there's nothing much in this that I wanted to show you. Okay, this is just the red neurons. Again, just to highlight that, see these? These bright pink ones, these are the red neurons. Okay, so that we covered neuronal injury, all right? Everyone happy with neuronal injury so far? Anyone wants anything repeated? Okay, all right. So now we go on to the reactions of the glial cells. Okay, so before we just briefly to just mention the functions of the astrocyte, right? Astrocyte is a very important cell, the glial cell, okay? It does a whole lot of things just briefly to just mention all of them for the neurotransmitters, for glutamate, okay? It's very important. Um, synapses, immune modulation. And this is an important one here, regulating the blood brain barrier, the BBB, blood brain barrier. Okay. Uh, this is one of its most important functions. Okay. And we'll talk more about this uh, later when we're coming to hypoxia. Okay. It's important in maintaining the brain glycogen energy reserves, um, also in regulating the, the ions, the the potassium, the hydrogen, the water, the sodium, all these things, right? So the astrocytes do a lot of work. Okay. And this is your astrocyte hard at work, maintaining your blood brain barrier. This is the astrocyte. These are its processes. This is a blood vessel here. And you can see over here how the astrocyte processes, they cover the blood vessel to maintain the blood brain barrier, okay? And we'll talk more about this as I told you when we come to hypoxia. Okay, so we come to reactions of astrocytes to injury. Okay, and this reaction, the reaction of astrocytes to injury, this term, this word is called gliosis. So when you hear the term gliosis, that's what it means, right? And the other uh, thing that you can see, the other morphological change that you can see is something called Rosenthal fibers. We'll just quickly go through Rosenthal fibers now, and then we'll go back to gliosis, right? So in Rosenthal fibers, what happens is you get these thick, you know, elongated, brightly eosinophilic, elongated like uh, fibers, structures, okay, um, that occur. Okay, and they basically contain proteins. I think they contain heat shock proteins and so on. And they are typically found in regions of long standing gliosis. So if you see those, you know that there's some sort of long standing chronic damage going on. Okay. And this is what it looks like. See these black arrow heads here? These pink elongated fibers, eosinophilic things here, here. Once you see them, you'll be able to see a lot more of them everywhere, right? You can see there's lots of them, okay? Just these two have been highlighted to show you what they look like, right? So this tells you that there is some long-standing chronic uh, injury to the brain. Okay, so that was Rosenthal fibers, right? Um, then we come to gliosis, right? And this is the most important histopathological indicator of injury in the brain, okay? Because as I told you, sometimes you don't always see neuronal cell loss very early, right? Sometimes it takes a while for, it, for you to be able to see it on uh, histology, okay? But gliosis, you'll be able to see, okay? So gliosis, basically all it is, is there's hypertrophy and hyperplasia of the astrocytes. What happens is that the nuclei become you know, they become bigger, they become larger. There's evenly dispersed 
chromatin and is accumulation of GFAP, right? And GFAP, I showed you already, we have a special stain for it, immunohistochemical stain, so we can pick it up, right? On uh, the slides that we see, okay? The cytoplasm expands, it becomes bright pink, right? Remember when they were uh, in the neurons as well, the cytoplasm became bright pink, right? Um, and we would see red neurons. Well, in gliosis also, this can happen. And you can also see bright pink uh, astrocytes. And when this occurs, when you see these bright pink astrocytes with these processes sticking out, these are often called gemistocytic astrocytes, right? And even the, the, the microglia also proliferate and accumulate in response to injury. The thing with the ependymal cells is they don't usually change much, right? The main change occurs in the astrocytes. Even the oligodendrocytes don't really undergo much change in, uh, in injury, right? So the main change occurs in the astrocytes. So when we talk about gliosis, we're talking usually about the astrocytic reactions. Okay, right, so this is the normal brain. Okay, just showing you all the processes, some neurons. Okay, and these are all the, uh, the glial cells. Okay, this now is a reactive gliosis. Okay, gliosis we mentioned. See, there's a these are all astrocytes here. And you can see the nuclei have become bigger in this. Okay. Uh, and there's a lot more staining for GFAP in reactive gliosis compared to the normal brain. Right. They take up this brownish stain. This is GFAP. Okay, so we've just concluded the part about uh, the reactions of the neurons and the glial cells to injury. Okay, and now we're gonna move on to edema. Are we all happy? Are there any questions? Can we move on? Okay. All right, so now we've finished with that part of the injury. Now we go on to cerebral edema, okay? Now, before we do edema, you have to understand uh, just briefly about the blood-brain barrier, right? BBB, this is the abbreviation you may see, the BBB, blood-brain barrier, okay? Right, so this is just a small cross-section of the brain showing you there's the blood vessel here the line is lined by endothelial cells here. There's the RBCs in there. And there may be large molecules and small molecules. As you can see, the large molecules are not able to move across from the blood into the brain, but the tiny molecules, they may be able to pass through and enter the brain, okay? So um, here, if you see, it's showing you this area here, which is the junction between the, the two endothelial cells. See, these are endothelial cells which are lining the capillary, okay? And this, these are the tight junctions here, okay? And you can see that these are the foot processes of the astrocyte. There's the astrocyte here, there's its foot processes and it covers the capillary from the outside, right? You can see it's covering it from the outside. So in addition to these tight junctions, there's also the foot processes of the astrocytes, which contribute to the blood brain barrier. Okay. So normally in, in the, the rest of our body where we have capillaries, this is what the capillary looks like. There's the blood, there's the uh, endothelial cells and there's the space here and you'll get tight junctions in between, right? And this space is called, you know, it's called a fenestration, right? But the basal membrane is intact, okay? In the brain, what happens is, that's here on the right side, 
In addition to this, you also have the food processes of the astrocytes, okay? And um, they provide an additional barrier and they prevent, um, they prevent, um, you know, the everything from just rushing blindly into the brain, okay? So it's a control mechanism and uh, a very important, okay, to protect the brain. Okay, so that was just briefly a bit about the blood-brain barrier. Now we come to edema. Now you all know already that the brain and the spinal cord are encased and protected by bone, right? In the case of your brain, it's protected by your skull. In the case of your uh, spinal cord, it's protected by the vertebrae, right? You know, you have a whole big column, your backbone, the vertebral column, and it very nicely looks after the spinal cord, which goes all the way down, okay? So you have a built-in protection for your brain and spinal cord already, okay? So now, but the problem is that if you have an increase in pressure in the brain, for example, now you have your skull, which is a bony, you know, uh, hard, rigid structure. So if there's increase in the pressure, what's going to happen? The pressure is going to build up immediately. So even some small uh, pathology, even some benign pathology can cause, uh, you know, serious effects, pressure effects, okay? So where do you think the pressure within the cranial cavity can rise? What are some of the things that can increase the pressure in the cranial cavity? Can anyone think of anything? Meningitis, okay, so inflammation, trauma, hydrocephalus, good, tumor. Yeah, okay, so you all have an idea already, okay? So you can get something called generalized brain edema. So it just means the swelling in the brain, okay? You mentioned hydrocephalus, so increase in the CSF volume, right? Then focally expanding mass lesion, okay? So a lot of you mentioned tumor, okay? Uh, or bleeding, hemorrhage, right? A blood clot is also a focally expanding mass lesion, right? Um, a herniation can occur. Herniation is a result of the increase in the, uh, uh, you know, the, like in, when the brain becomes edematous, it has nowhere to expand, then it starts to herniate. Okay, right, so any focally expanding mass lesion, right? So these are the three categories, okay, that, uh, that can cause pressure inside the cranial cavity to rise. So brain parent, when we talk about cerebral edema, we are talking about brain parenchymal edema. And this basically is the result of increased, uh, you know, the fluid uh, movement from blood vessels or injury to various cells of the CNS, okay? So increased fluid leakage from the blood vessels. So basically, what does that mean? This increased fluid leakage from the blood vessels, where does the fluid leak to? What does it mean? It means it leaks from the blood vessels into the extracellular space, right? So there's two main pathways for cerebral edema, right? One is vasogenic edema, and the second one is cytotoxic edema. So as you can see from the, from the names, vasogenic means to do with the blood vessels, right? Cytotoxic means something that is harmful to the cell. Cytocell, toxic, harmful, or poisonous, right? So these are the two main pathways for edema. So we look at the first one now, the vasogenic edema, okay? And this is the one where we talk about the fluid gradients, right? So there's increased um, in the ECF, okay? Um, and this is because of the disruption of the blood-brain barrier and increased vascular permeability right? So what happens is that the, the fluid basically moves from the blood vessel into the extracellular space, right? 
okay? And because we don't have lymphatics in the brain um, that impairs the resorption of fluid, like if this would happen somewhere else, then the lymphatics would help in getting rid of this excess fluid. But in the brain, because there's very few lymphatics, this is a problem, right? That fluid is not resorbed easily. The important thing to remember is that in vasogenic cerebral edema, right? The neurons are not primarily injured, right? So the neurons are actually okay. It's, it's the problem in the hydrostatics the, of the, you know, the fluid dynamics, the hemodynamics, right? So that is the vasogenic edema. Because of the problem in hemodynamics, okay, uh, the fluid increases in the, in, in the extracellular space, there's increased vascular permeability, the blood-brain barrier is disrupted and so on. Um, so that is called vasogenedema, right? So remember the neurons are not primarily injured, but they can become injured secondary to this edema, right? Because of the pressure, then they, if that pressure is not relieved, if you don't treat that edema, then the neurons can become secondarily injured. And that is why you'll see a lot of patients in the neurosurgical wards, they are put on treatment for uh, cerebral edema. Oftentimes those who have you know, severe cerebral edema, what they do is they actually cut a piece of the skull, okay? And they open a flap, giving the, the brain space to expand, okay? So this edema may be localized, you know, as sometimes you'll see with tumors in one particular spot or, or like um, hemorrhages we mentioned, intracranial hematomas, um, infarcts, abscesses, whatever, you know, some inflammatory process or some ischemic process. So it can be localized to one area or it can be generalized as you can see in some general ischemic injury, okay? If there's a generalized hypoxic event, then that can cause vasogenic edema. Okay, and therapy, I mentioned to you already that it's important to prevent secondary damage to the surrounding brain tissue, okay? Since the neurons are fine, they're not damaged, okay? But you have to prevent any damage to them. So therefore treatment is given to reduce this edema. They give certain drugs and they may also do surgical procedures like I mentioned. Okay, so that was vasogenic edema. Everyone okay with vasogenic edema? Okay, so now we go on to the second type, which is the cytotoxic edema. Okay, so the cytotoxic edema. So this is caused by intracellular swelling, secondary to direct cell injury, right? So remember in vasogenic, there was no primary neuronal injury. In cytotoxic edema, there is neuronal injury, okay? And because of the injury, there's intracellular swelling, and this swelling then causes the cytotoxic edema, okay? And this is common in patients who have, you know, who've undergone trauma, okay? Or if there's a generalized hypoxic ischemic situation, or patients who have, you know, any metabolic derangements that prevent maintenance of the normal membrane gradients and so on, right? But the primary problem is the direct cell injury, right? That's why it's called cytotoxic, okay? And obviously these injuries can range from reversible to irreversible depending on the severity, okay? Right, so just to clarify, in vasogenic edema, this is the one we did first, right? So there was influx of fluid into the interstitial space, right? So the plasma escapes out from the blood vessel and goes into the interstitial space and that causes edema. But in cytotoxic edema, the fluid is inside the brain cells, so inside the neurons, right? So the neurons themselves become edematous, right? The neurons, the astrocytes, all the cells in the brain become edematous. Okay, are you happy with the distinction? You understand the distinction? Okay. Also, you must remember that in 
some cases of generalized cerebral edema, you can get the mechanism can be both. It can be vasogenic and cytotoxic. And this often happens, right? Where you can get an element of vasogenic edema as well as cytotoxic edema. Okay. Okay, somebody is asking to repeat the mechanism of um, cytotoxic edema. Okay. So in cytotoxic edema, what happens is there's direct injury to the cell, the direct neuronal injury, right? And because like occurs, you remember in first year, we taught you about cell injury. What happens in cell injury? The first thing that happens is that the cell swells, there's intracellular swelling. That's part of the reaction of a normal cell to injury. So because of the cell swelling, all your neurons, your glial cells, all of them become edematous. So that is the mechanism in cytotoxic edema, okay? Right, so there's influx of fluid inside the brain cells. Whereas in the vasogenic, the fluid is where? The fluid is not in the brain cells. The brain cells are fine, right? The fluid is because of movement of fluid from the capillaries into the interstitial space, all right? So that's the difference. Okay, so this is just to show you a picture of what the cerebral edema looks like. Okay, there's just a, one more category we'll mention quickly. This is hydrocephalic edema, okay? And this is also called interstitial edema, okay? And this basically just means uh, increased fluid in the periventricular area, right? Because there's increased uh, CSF pressure um, that occurs in hydrocephalus, right? In hydrocephalus, you know, there's increase in the CSF pressure, okay? And this is the commonest cause, right? And this occurs around the lateral ventricles, okay? Um, because of the, you know, the, the movement of CSF uh, moves across from the ventricles into the periventricular area, okay? And this often responds to therapy to reduce CSF pressure. Okay, so this is just to show you the different, you know, the different ventricles. This is the uh, lateral ventricle here. Uh, this is the interventricular foramen, right? The third ventricle here. Uh, you can see this is the cerebral aqueduct, all right? And right here at the bottom is the fourth ventricle, okay? All right, so this is just to show you the different ventricles. And in hydrocephalus, what happens is you have increased CSF pressure in the ventricles, okay? And this causes uh, edema. And you know that hydrocephalus, uh, if it occurs in small children, um, infants whose brain, whose uh, skull is still soft, then the skull grows with the, as the brain grows, the skull also grows. So these kids have very large heads, okay? But if this hydrocephalus occurs in an adult, there's no space for that um, enlargement, then you start to get cystic dil dilation of the ventricles. Okay. So in cerebral edema, the brain becomes softer, the gyri become flattened, the sulci become narrowed, right? The, the ventricles are, are compressed because of this increased pressure. So basically the brain expands and you can get something called herniation, okay? So herniation is what? Her when we say herniation, we mean there's actually displacement of the brain tissue past the rigid dural folds. You know that we, the, the dura has certain folds, like we have the falx cerebri, okay? And we also have the tentorium, right? So these are folds of the dura, which keep hold the brain in place, okay? So herniation is when the brain tissue can be displaced past these folds or either they go through any openings in the skull because of increased intracranial pressure, right? And if there is any head injury, if for example, that patient sustained a, a gunshot wound to the head and there's a hole in the skull, then the brain can herniate through that hole or it can herniate down. Um, wait, I'll show you a picture now. 
herniate down through the foramen and near the spinal cord, right? So this is a picture showing you the brain, the cerebral edema, right? Okay, and this one shows you all the different, <coughs> excuse me, the different types of um, herniation that can occur, right? Um, you can see here, this is the Falk cerebri here. So you can get something called subfalcine or cingulate herniation, where the brain can herniate that way, or it can herniate. This is the tentorium, this white line here. This is the tentorium. So it can be transtentorial, moving past this, also called uncle, because of the brain, the uncus is here. Transcalvarial, this means external, right? Like, as I mentioned, if there was already an opening, there was some trauma, uh, like a gunshot wound, for example, so the brain can herniate there. Or this one is quite common, tontilla, right? Where it moves down this way, okay? And this is usually cerebellar because this, the cerebellum is here. So the cerebellum can herniate down through here. And this is called tonsillar herniation, okay? So you can see this patient has a blood clot right okay so that was herniation <clears throat> so now we've finished with edema and we finished with neuronal injury is everyone happy before we move on to the very important topic of hypoxia i hope everyone is still awake huh okay right so um, this is just to show you the different, um, you know, the areas that are supplied by different parts of the, uh, the different parts of the brain that are supplied by the different blood vessels. So this part is supplied by the anterior cerebral artery. Okay. Here, this part is supplied by the middle cerebral artery, right? And then the posterior part, this is supplied by the branches of the posterior cerebral artery, right? You can see the different colors, right? This one is red, showing you the middle cerebral artery, then the, the sort of purplish color, anterior, and then this greenish one is showing you the posterior parts. Okay, and uh, just showing you, just reminding you about the circle of Willis, right? You must have already heard of this and done it in neuroanatomy, all right? Um, that's your anterior communicating artery, the internal carotid, the anterior, this is the anterior cerebral artery here, right? That's on one side and that's the other side. Okay, then you have the posterior, this side, all the different um, blood vessels that are in the circle of Willis, right? Okay, so now we come to the important part about Hypoxia, ischemia, and infarction, right? So now you already know, right, that the brain requires a constant supply of glucose and oxygen, right? It's very important for proper functioning of the brain, right? And how does this get to the brain? It comes via the cerebral blood vessels, the ones I just mentioned now, the anterior, the middle, the posterior, okay, and that whole circle of Willis with all its communicating arteries and so on. Right now, even though the brain only accounts for one to two percent of your whole body weight, right, but it receives 15 percent of the resting cardiac output and 20 percent of your body's oxygen consumption, right? So, by weight, it's very small, but functionally, it requires a lot of um, glucose and oxygen, okay? Now Thankfully, our cerebral blood flow, usually it remains relatively constant, okay? Even though, you know, during the day, your blood pressure goes up and down, it varies. Um, uh, and the intracranial pressure is also kept more or less constant, okay? Because of autoregulation, our body, you know, is really is an amazing thing. We are able to do so many things automatically. You don't even know it. While you are sitting and listening to me, your brain the blood vessels in your brain, everything is working at optimum to keep all your, your blood pressures and everything, your intracranial pressure all intact, okay, all constant, okay. So 
when we talk about hypoxia, we are now talking about deprivation of oxygen, right? Hypoxia, hypo, low, oxia, oxygen, right? So hypoxia basically means decreased oxygen supply, right? And what is ischemia? Hypoxia is decreased oxygen supply and ischemia is what? What is ischemia? What's the definition of ischemia? Decreased blood flow, yeah. Okay, all of you are saying the same thing, right. So decreased blood flow, okay. So hypoxia and ischemia, these are the two main mechanisms by which your, blood, your brain may be de deprived of oxygen, okay. And infarction, infarction just means cell death because of ischemia, right. So hypoxia, ischemia and infarction. So hypoxia means there's a low partial pressure of oxygen, okay? So this may be either there's impairment of the blood's oxygen carrying capacity, right? Or there's inhibition of some oxygen use in the tissue, okay? So what are these? These are two different things, right? When can your blood's oxygen carrying capacity be impaired? Can you think of any condition? where the blood's oxygen carrying capacity can be impaired. Anemia, excellent. Anusha, Minna, yes, all of you are correct. Yes, poisoning, good, Zenith, right? Carbon monoxide poisoning, okay, good. So you're on the right track, right? So they can be impairment of the blood's oxygen carrying capacity or there is something that is that has caused hypoxia. Okay. Right. So ischemia, right? So ischemia can be global or focal. So this can be either hypotension, right? If suddenly your blood pressure drops, what happens when people faint, right? Some people are prone to low blood pressure. Sometimes something happens, their blood pressure drops, and suddenly they faint because the brain hasn't received enough oxygen. Or you can have obstruction of blood vessels of the small vessel or a large blood vessel. This can cause ischemia. And this is what happens in a stroke, right? In a stroke, what's a stroke? It's a cerebrovascular accident, right? So either there is some obstruction to the blood vessel. And so now there is um, ischemia occurs, right? Okay, and obviously the response to this now and the survival of your patient will depend upon lots of things, right? Whether or not there is a collateral circulation. So if it's blocked at one place, can the blood get to the brain by some other uh, route, okay? Also, how long was the ischemia? Was the ischemia for one minute or was the ischemia for 15 minutes, okay? This is very important in things like drowning, okay? If the brain was without oxygen for just a few minutes compared to if that brain was without oxygen for 15 minutes, for example. And obviously the magnitude and the speed at which this uh, ischemia occurred or this hypoxia occurred, right? And obviously all these things will also impact you know, will be impacted by which part of the brain is affected. Obviously, if it's the posterior cerebral arteries involved, then it's going to affect those areas that are supplied by the posterior cerebral artery. Okay. And the size of the lesion is important. Is it a tiny pinpoint lesion or is it a huge, big ping pong ball sized thing? Right. So all these things will affect the clinical, um, you know, the, the clinical scenario. And you know that the brain needs, uh, and it's primarily dependent on oxidative metabolism. So it needs oxygen to generate ATP. Okay. So what happens when there is ischemia? Okay. So if you start here, 
And ischemia means, what did we say ischemia meant? It meant decreased blood supply. So if this, you're not getting blood supply, you're not getting enough oxygen, right? So there will be depletion of the ATP, depletion of ATP, loss of membrane, that will lead to loss of membrane potential. And because of these changes, you'll find increased um, uh, calcium levels inside the cytoplasm, okay? And then that activates a whole cascade of enzymatic processes that contribute to cell injury, right? So the main starting point is the ischemia, which results in the depletion of ATP. And this sets off this whole cascade of things, okay? So now we have global cerebral ischemia and we have focal cerebral ischemia. So what is global cerebral ischemia? Global means, you know, the whole entirety, okay? So this is a diffuse encephalopathy, okay? When there's generalized reduction of cerebral perfusion as occurs in, you know, sh uh, shock or in severe hypotension, okay? So this is a diffuse process, okay? Clinically, they can be mild or severe, you know, mild, moderate, severe. You can just have a transient confusional state followed by complete recovery, okay? And there are different syndromes, clinical syndromes associated with this. You may have heard the term TIA, which is a transient ischemic attack. Okay, what happens is the patient, um, just for a few brief seconds to minutes um, is in confusion or there may be loss of consciousness and then they recover after that, okay? So that's called a TIA, a transient ischemic attack, okay? Then you have something called RIND or RIND, which is reversible ischemic neurological deficit. So that's reversible as the name implies. So this is usually longer than a few minutes, but it's still reversible. So your patient recovers from that. But in severe, then that's when we're talking about things like strokes, okay? And if it's severe enough that your patient can die, you can get brain death. Then you get something called watershed or border zone infarcts. Now, what, when does this happen? This basically happens, remember I told you the brain is supplied by, you know, the anterior, the middle, the posterior cerebral arteries, right? Sometimes you get um, those areas affected the most that are, you know, that are furthest away from the blood supply, okay? Or they may be at the border zone between two arterial territories, right? So if you get one area supplied by the middle cerebral artery and the other area supplied by the uh, posterior cerebral artery, then that area which is furthest from both of them, which is at the border, right? You can get infarcts occurring there, okay? Um, because they are furthest away from the blood supply. And those are called watershed or border zone infarcts, right? And of all your brain cells, your, the neurons are the most sensitive, okay? Remember the neuron are the functional unit of the is. I'm talking about in comparison to the glial cells, like the astrocytes and so on, the neurons are the ones that are most sensitive, okay? Morphologically, what will you see? You'll see an edematous brain, right? In early changes, you'll see the red neurons, okay? Uh, you'll see tiny vacuoles, then you can get eosinophilia, right? And then that's followed by the pycnosis and cariorexis, okay? So this starts off in the neurons and then later on affects the glial cells as well. And you'll see influx of neutrophils, okay? The inflammatory cells. Remember, inflammatory cells always come in when there's infarction, okay? Then the subacute changes, these come in later. These can last up to as long as two weeks. You'll see the tissue necrosis. You'll see inflammation, the macrophages. Um, and then there'll be gliosis. After about two weeks, then the repair process starts. Okay, There's removal of the necrotic tissue. Um, you start to see, remember in the brain, first year again, when we were discussing the different types of ne necrosis, I don't know, I may have taught you in first year, about cell injury and necrosis, right? Um, remember in the brain, what kind of necrosis was it? Do you remember? Anyone? What kind of necrosis was in the brain? Liquefactive, good, Priyanka. 
Good, Shabash. Right, so there's liquefactive necrosis in the brain, right? Um, so you get loss of the normal architecture, okay? And eventually it'll just become a liquefied mass. You may have heard this term or you may hear of this term called pseudo laminar necrosis. Pseudo false, lamina means like layers, right? So false layers, why this happens is that because the gliosis and the neuronal loss is uneven, so some areas are fine, some areas are dead, some areas are fine. So because of this, you may find like uh, uh, morphologically, you may see some layer like appearance, right? Because of the different, uh, you know, some areas are, are viable and some are necrotic. That's why it's called pseudo lamina, right? Okay, so that's the red neurons we mentioned. Okay, this is all the debris of caused by the PMN, the polymorpho nuclear neutrophils, basically, right? And now here you find mononuclear cells coming in. These are foamy macrophages. So these all occur in different stages of injury. Okay, so that was global cerebral ischemia, right? So it affected the entire brain, right? Focal ischemia, okay? So this means there is reduction in the blood flow or cessation of blood flow to a localized area, okay? Either due to arterial occlusion or hypoperfusion in that particular focus, in that particular area, okay? And if this ischemia is not relieved, then infarction will occur. So you know that infarction is cell death after ischemia, okay? What are some of the causes, okay? Either you can get a thrombotic occlusion, okay, and this occurs in things like atherosclerosis, rupture of an atherosclerotic plaque. Um, you can get a blockage in the carotid bifurcation. You can get blockages in the, you know, the origin of the arteries or either end of the basal arteries. Okay, these are the common sites, right? So often patients who have strokes, it's because of uh, thrombotic occlusion of these particular areas. Okay, embolism, right? Embolism that can originate in the heart, in the arteries, okay? Um, any embolism associated with the surgeries, okay? Tumor emboli, fat emboli, patients who sustain trauma, undergo fractures of long bones, then fat, fatty marrow can embolize to the brain, okay? Air emboli, if there is some trauma to the lungs, okay? The middle cerebral artery is most frequently affected by embolism, right? So we looked at thrombi, we looked at emboli. And the third one is in the blood vessel itself, if there's some problem, vasculitis, right? So there's inflammation of the blood vessel that causes some occlusion. So these are the causes of focal cerebral ischemia. Just quickly to show you some pictures, okay? Um, so this is a patient who had a fracture and these are multiple, you can see tiny little black spots. These are all tiny uh, areas of, uh, you know, embolization. This occurred in fat emboli, fatty marrow. This is called shower embolization because it's widespread, multiple pinpoints. Okay. So in, in the morphology in focal ischemia, if it's a non-hemorrhagic infarct, again, you know, similar things, you'll see the red neurons first, you'll see edema, okay? Mm -hmm. um, then you'll see the neutrophils, the phagocytosis and so on, right? Um, the reactive astrocytes, liquefaction we mentioned, remember? Liquefaction, um, the astrocytes at the edge of the lesion, they enlarge and they develop these prominent, this is all the, re uh, the gliosis that we mentioned. And after a few months, you may just find a dense network of glial fibers, connective tissue, and this becomes a cavity that's separated by gliotic, you know, layer of tissue. Okay. So that was the non-hemorrhagic infarcts. The hemorrhagic infarcts, you can see similar changes, but in addition to that, you'll just see a whole lot of blood, right? To just simplify things. Okay. So similar things, just with a whole lot of blood. Right, so there's edema here. The red neurons I showed you already. There's a whole lot of neutrophils coming in. Okay. Um, the mononuclear cells coming in. And this last one shows you gliosis. 
is rushing because I can see we're out of time now. Um, this is just showing you ischemic infarction in the region of the middle cerebral artery. Right, you can see here. Punctate hemorrhages. Okay. Here. And this is an old infarct cystic is the whole cortex is destroyed and there's this cavity that's formed okay so just quickly let's review what were the cells in the cns neurons and glia yes good which were the glial cells you remember Four of them, quickly, quickly. Astrocytes, yes. Then, ependymal cells, oligodendrocytes, microglia, good, shabash. And what were the reactions to injury we mentioned? The neurons. Remember we mentioned there was acute injury and then there was more of a subacute chronic injury, right? Yes, red neurons we mentioned, okay. And then in the more chronic ones, we mentioned the we mentioned the gliosis and the Rosenthal fibers. Yes, reactive gliosis. Okay, good. Cerebral edema. What are the two types? What were the two types of cerebral edema? Vasogenic and cytotoxic. Good. Shabash. What's the difference between the two? We we'll look at it just now. The difference between the two okay i have a nice slide showing you the differences okay yes in the vasogenic there was problems with the blood brain barrier it was basically hemodynamic and then the cytotoxic one was the primary neuronal injury okay what is hydrocephalus what was hydrocephalus increase in what Increased CSF pressure, good. Shabash in the ventricles, yes, good. Right. What is herniation? What is herniation? It's when the brain expands and then, yes, Zahra, good. Displacement of the tissue, okay. It can either protrude through any opening, yes or it can um, bypass you know the, the areas of fixed dura like it can go under the forks okay it's called subfalcine or it can go past the tentorium which is called transtentorial remember or it can um, go through this opening in the skull that's called transcalvarial right or it can go down cerebellar tonsillar herniation okay good Cerebral hypoxia, the types of cerebral hypoxia, which we just did now. Yes, we mentioned focal and global, right? The global one was the generalized one, which usually occurs in things like severe hypotension or heart attacks, for example. The focal one, the focal one occurs when? I told you three main causes for the focal one. What were they? Do you remember? Yes, obstruction, thrombi, good. Shabash, embolism, good. And the last one was, if there's a problem in the blood vessel, good. Anusha, vasculitis, good, Shabash. Right. Okay. So this, I just had the slide, I saved it for the review. For you to just see the difference between the different types of edema. Okay. And the vasogenic one, remember, was a hemodynamic problem where there's increased fluid in the ECF. Cytotoxic was a main problem in the cells itself, okay? Where the cells themselves become, there's increased fluid in the cell itself. And interstitial was the one that occurs, the hydrocephalic edema, and that occurs in the periventricular area, right? Okay. Right, so any questions? I know that time is uh, almost finished. How is the um, generalized hypoxia could be 
mild and moderate bitter depending on how long the hypo like for example i gave you the example of drowning right or if you hold your breath for example some people can hold their breath for a long time okay so if it's just for a short period like a, 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 you know up to a minute then um, you know it will be mild but if this hypoxia is long standing okay um, 15 minutes half an hour then it's going to have more severe effects right okay uh, just to mention in acknowledgments uh, I, I used some of dr rukaya shahid's uh, slides thank thank you to her for allowing me to use her slides okay right so um, if you remember any other questions then you feel free to email me uh, this is my email address okay feel free to email me if you remember any questions afterwards that you have okay all right, so if that's all, then we'll end the session. Thank you. Uh, wait, there is one question. Within what range of blood pressure can the brain's autoregulation work? Okay, I don't remember the exact figures for this, but I'm assuming it will be the, the normal blood pressures that we usually, uh, you know, people can survive with. There's a lot of people have low blood pressure. Normally they can have pressures of like 90 over 60 and still be fine. And for some people, if it drops below that, you know, they start to feel hypotensive. And then you have undiagnosed hypertens hypertensives walking around everywhere. People with blood pressures of like 180 over 120 and they're walking around and the brain is working, but it does affect the brain, okay? But for specific figures I'll have to check, I don't know. Okay, so um, I think that's it. Okay, so thank you, um, Dr. Shahid. We can end the session. Thank you.